Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program about former First Lady Nancy Reagan, featuring Karen Tumulty, author of the new biography, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Tuesday, May 4th, noted constitutional scholar Akhil Reed Amar will discuss his new book, The Words That Made Us, an account of how Americans wrestled with weighty constitutional questions during the country's first half century. And on Thursday, May 6th at noon, we'll hear from former New York Times White House correspondent Robert M. Smith, whose new book, Suppressed, reveals how some stories make it to print while others are ignored. The president's wife, the first lady, has long been a figure of public fascination, although she holds no official office in the national government. There are no written guidelines for what the presidential spouse should do, and each woman adapts the role to her own interests. When Nancy Reagan entered the White House with her husband, President Ronald Reagan, she was seen as a devoted helpmeet, unlikely to be an activist first lady like Eleanor Roosevelt. In the eight years of the Reagan administration, Nancy acted as a true partner to the president and most trusted confidant. To write the triumph of Nancy Reagan, Karen Tumulty spent years conducting interviews and poring over letters, memoirs, and White House records in archives, including the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, which is operated by the National Archives and Records Administration. Our presidential libraries, which document the work of chief executives since Herbert Hoover, have a wealth of information about the presidents, their administrations, and their families. First ladies are well represented by the collections of their official and personal papers. As Barbara A. Perry recently wrote in the Washington Post Book World, Relying on Nancy's previously unavailable papers at the Reagan Library and interviews with her son and stepbrother, Tumulty is able to construct a persuasive portrait of the future First Lady's character development. Researchers and writers such as today's guests have made extensive use of the library's collections, and there are still many stories yet to be told from these records. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Karen Tumulty is a political columnist for the Washington Post. Before joining the Post, she wrote for Time Magazine. In her role as a national political correspondent, she received the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. Previously at the Los Angeles Times, she reported on Congress, business, energy, and economics from Los Angeles, New York, and Washington, D.C. Sheila Tate is the author of Lady in Red, a biography of Nancy Reagan. Her political and government experience ranges from her service as press secretary to First Lady Nancy Reagan and as press secretary to George H.W. Bush during his successful campaign for the presidency in 1988 and for the 1989 presidential transition period. Please join me in welcoming Karen Tumulty and Sheila Tate. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, I'm Sheila Tate. I was <laughs> assuming Karen would jump on before me because she's really the star of this whole thing. Um, I, I have read her book. I, in fact, I spent one whole day reading the entire book because I was mesmerized how someone who did not uh, know Nancy Reagan personally had written such an incredibly um, honest book. I mean, it, it, there's nothing in that book that I would disagree with. And believe me, I've read a lot of these Nancy Reagan books where I did disagree. So I, I hold Karen in high regard, and I uh, recommend the book to you without, without any question. Karen? Well, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, and thank you. I, you know, relied on talking to you and also reading your own extraordinary book, Lady in Red, which was really a personal look at her, part memoir, but really the way you were able to get people around her to open up was just extraordinary. And it is also a real honor to be here tonight, even virtually at the National Archives, because I did spend so many weeks at the Reagan Library. 
I'd never written a book before. I didn't even know if I could write a book. And um, they had just the help I got, especially from one archivist, Jennifer Mandel, who was like the perfect tour guide to history was just amazing. Um, this book, as I said, I'd never written a book before. And it was really only after a couple of years of research uh, that the pieces, the many, many pieces of this very, very complicated um, woman began to fit together for me. And I began to realize that, you know, if I did this right, this was not just going to be a biography of a woman, of a first lady, a, a marriage that was an epic love story, but that by understanding Nancy Reagan, you would really understand the rise of one of the most consequential figures of the 20th century, um, really the shaping of the Reagan presidency and ultimately the shaping of his legacy because she was there and just an integral part of every bit of it. And I, again, was fortunate enough to uh, have the memories and, and recollections of so many people around her, including one of the smartest things she ever did when she was uh, going through one of her very toughest periods as first lady was to bring in a very sophisticated uh, communications expert who was then named Sheila Patton. <laughs> So uh, well, the truth, the, uh, can I tell you that the truth of it is that every day was an adventure at the beginning because none of us knew what we were doing. We just, you know, we just did the best we could. And I think um, she somehow survived all our experimentation. Well, one thing I was struck by, Sheila, though, was that, you know, people don't necessarily understand that President Reagan, for all of his affability, for all of his gift at connecting with the country, was really a very solitary figure. And Nancy Reagan was truly the only person in the world to whom he was personally close. And I was really surprised as I did my research how important important it was for him to have her, her there with him because her instincts about the people around him were in many cases superior to his. She seemed to have a better nose for trouble than he did. Um, I mean, certainly she was controversial in her time. She brought a lot of her problems on herself. So as shrewd as she was about his image, she was kind of confoundingly clueless sometimes about her own. <laughs> But my question for you is, as this was happening in real time, did you guys really understand how important she was to the success of the Reagan presidency? And really, again, not just as his advisor, but real, that she, you know, she had an influence on policy. We came to recognize that. I mean, when, when people like Gorbachev was, you know, he was paying enormous attention to her. Um, he recognized it. So you started to see that and there were a lot of international people who were calling and talking to her. Um, a, lot, a, a number of uh, uh, wives of presidents around the world. There were just a lot of interplay that I think they knew that Nancy Reagan um, could be trusted with whatever they told her or asked her about. She, you know, she never ever betrayed a trust, and that 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 was like gold, you know, in, in a political White House. Well, I think that you know, if she had to pick what she wanted her own legacy to be, um, it, it, I was surprised in in talking to George Shultz really how important she was in helping Schultz to understand that Ronald Reagan for all of his Cold War anti-communist rhetoric really was interested 
and believed that he could change history by, you know, reaching out to the Soviet Union. This was something that a lot of people in his own administration didn't think was possible. Um, and the other thing I was struck by was how the smart people in that White House, uh, whether it was you know Schultz or somebody like Chief of Staff James Baker, were the ones who recognized that Nancy Reagan could be a very valuable ally to have, and that if you could get her on your side, uh, and if you could convince her that something was in the president's best interest, that uh, you had a good shot at, at getting him too. It was it was almost a, a lock <laughs> because she wouldn't she wouldn't if she was convinced this was something he had to do. It was good for him. It was good for the country. Whatever it was, she'd never let up on him until he just said, "Okay, all right, I'll do it." <laughs> she was very influential. Um, I think most wives are, you know, that have good marriages tend to be very influential uh, with regard to their husbands. But so why was she so clueless about her own interest? I mean, it was not given that, you know, the first year of his presidency, as you're being brought aboard, you know, mm -hmm. the country is in the worst recession since the Great Depression. It was not politically the smartest time to go redecorating the White House and buying expensive China and uh, borrowing designer fashions. Why was she so clueless about this? You know, I never figured that out. <clears throat> I think I think she felt, <clears throat> excuse me, I think she felt like she needed to get that house in the order she felt it, you know, it, the history demanded. And she was just going to go ahead with it. And I think she was willing to pay the price. But, that was definitely the sense that I got of it. But ultimately, you come up with what is a genius PR strategy, which is to get her to stand up in front of the Gridiron Club, which is a press organization here in Washington, gives one big dinner a year. And sing a song and make fun of herself. Nobody believed Nancy Hume, Nancy Reagan had a sense of humor, I think, until that moment. So um, was it hard to talk her into that? No, actually, she, um, I, what I did is I got, um, oh God, this is my memory failing, um, the, Helen Thomas um, to help me. And Helen Thomas was a big shot then in in, uh, uh, in terms of the gridiron, and and I took her with me up to see Nancy and talk about it. And Nancy said, "I'll do it." She said, "But just let me figure out how I want to do it, and let's keep it a secret. It has to be a secret." Um, and um, we went to work. I mean, Muffy Brandon at the time was our our. Uh, social secretary and we brought her into the uh, circle and and got her to get some of the most outrageous disgusting clothes you've ever seen nothing matched everything looked awful on her and she she wore these basically we we took a, a basket of this stuff over to the hotel in advance so that when she got there she was properly dressed and then and then she left uh, and I'll never forget this. I was sitting between two men, and uh, she she was the the thing that was making fun of her. The the gridiron started to. Um, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing in the background. Um, they they started to. Um, they assumed when they saw her get up and leave, she was really getting up to go get dressed to do this act. Um, that one leaned, I, there were two publishers, one on either side of me, and one leaned across behind me to the other one and said, Nancy Reagan's leaving. I bet she's, and I won't use the word, but it starts with a P. And it's, it, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And I just, I just stared straight ahead as if I didn't even hear it. Um, and, um, when she came out, nobody even knew at first 
this ra this somebody came out with a rack of clothes. And this was, you know, part of the song that was going on. And then she um, came through the middle of that, that rack. And at first, nobody knew who it was. And all of a sudden, they started realizing and everybody started screaming. I've never seen anything like it ever. And, and I've, I've been to a lot of those events. And I knew we had it made. One thing, though, that I came across in my research, and as we watch these photos go by, um, you know, in trying to explain why the Reagans were so closely bound together, you know, unusually close, even for a loving, successful marriage, mm -hmm. um, I really decided that it, oh, it was true, rooted in, the, in part, at least, in the fact that both of them had come through very difficult childhoods uh, and that they really found in each other a security and a stability that both of them had needed. Um, in Nancy's case, she was actually abandoned by her act. She, she would not use that word. I'm sure she would bristle at that word, but her actress mother, you know, left her with relatives for six years in Bethesda, just outside of Washington here, and really traumatized her. I mean, she spent the next six years of her life just yearning for this absent mother. Um, Edith Davis ultimately remarries, brings her to Chicago with her. Uh, Nancy adores her stepfather. You know, he becomes the second most important man in her life. But as her son Ron told me, those years had really left a, a shadow on her spirit that never really lifted, a fear that the bottom could drop out at any moment. And surely when she almost loses her husband to a would-be assassin to two months in his, mm -hmm. his pregnancy, uh, pregnancy, pregnancy presidency, you know, that seems to be confirmed. And I was wondering, did she ever talk about those difficult years in Bethesda when she missed her mother and the, the kind of shadow that it really left her with. I, he would tell me about uh, the loneliness when her mother left her because she As she got older, she started recognizing how, how hard it was on both of them. But, I mean, she was intensely loyal to her mother. Um, she, um, she, ne she, I think she had a terrible trauma with the, um, the father that locked her into the bathroom. Do you remember that story? Yes, that, that would be her biological father, who she right. essentially wouldn't even recognize right. as her father. She was completely right. estranged from him until he right. died. Right. Yep. Well, the, the and the other thing, of course, uh, the president was the son of an alcoholic who had taken this family from one precarious situation into another. Uh, when he meets Nancy Davis, then a young actress on the MGM lot, on what was supposedly a blind date, though I found some evidence that Nancy had kind of set her eye on this guy fairly, fairly. I think early. she she did a little political work behind his, um, without his knowing about it. Right. <laughs> and, you know, she, he is really, a, people don't realize, a low point of his life when he meets Nancy yep. Davis. He's, yep. um, you know, he does have the shadows of his own childhood, his first wife has essentially gotten bored with him and walked out. His movie mm -hmm. career is coming to an end. He arrives on her doorstep, literally a broken man standing on two canes because his leg has been broken in six places in a baseball game. He's been in traction for two months. But Ronald Reagan would later say, if Nancy Davis hadn't come along when she did, I would have lost my soul. 
And even uh, their courtship doesn't exactly go all that smoothly either. I mean, this guy was not easy to pin down. Uh, <laughs> and at one point, even his mother, who seems to have liked Nancy better than she liked his first wife, Jane Wyman, says to Nancy, Nancy, I can see that you are in love with him, but he is not yet in love with you. You are just going to have to wait and you will know when he loves you. And I was really struck by, by that because certainly when the Reagans met, her career wasn't going anywhere. His life was scraping bottom and surely nobody could possibly have imagined what lie ahead for both of them. And they do have some very um, difficult years of their early marriage. Again, their careers aren't going anywhere. He's not getting any jobs. At one point, he has to take this completely humiliating gig, emceeing a floor show in Las Vegas. Oh, yeah, in Las Vegas. So what do you think she saw in him that probably wasn't, you know, incredibly terribly apparent to the rest of the world at that time. Um, well, Ronald Reagan had a way of um, gathering you in in a funny way because he was quiet, but um, he was. Uh, I think he, I think she was mesmerized by him. I really do. He was, he was not like most Hollywood guys. You know, he wasn't on the make. He was. He wanted to have a real relationship, and I think she valued that. And I think that's what attracted her to him. Well, she says, yeah, that he didn't seem to have the the movie star ego. Oh, we are just seeing a picture of the Reagans with Marilyn Monroe. Can I tell the story? Right. It was my <laughs> favorite little bit of trivia that. I dug up when I was doing uh, research for the book. And that is, so Nancy Davis, young actress, not terribly distinguished at that point, um, comes to Hollywood in 1949. Her screen test is sort of magical. It is set up by, among other people, Spencer Tracy, the famous actor who was actually a childhood friend of hers. So, you know, she, he gets a big deal director to direct it. And, and, you know, she does well enough to get a contract from the studio in 1949. But the fact that MGM offered a contract to the young Nancy Davis is one of the reasons that it took a pass on another actress that it was considering named Marilyn Monroe, which I think was probably <laughs> the worst decision in MGM ever made. From a monetary standpoint, you're probably right. <laughs> so how, how much did you think that their careers in Hollywood and their understanding of the like power of the visuals, the power of the image really shaped the success of his presidency? Well, I think there was an undertone of that. Um, I don't know that it dominated. Uh, you know, he, he, he was not, there was nothing false about Ronald Reagan. That's one of the things I think we all loved about him. Um, he, he was a genuine, wonderful human being. And, um, he, you, you you walked out of the Oval Office proud that he was president. I I don't think, um, I mean I think I I definitely think Hollywood shaped them, gave them an understanding of, um, you know what what um, kind of um, impression they left, and they 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 were always very careful to dress properly. I remember when we were flying to Alaska one time and um, he wanted to wear some cruddy old jacket. And she said, no, 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 you can't wear that. You can't wear that. And I remember them arguing back and forth about it. And she finally um, prevailed and he wore a, a nice warm coat. Uh, but it, that was all an image thing in her mind. I'm sure of it. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I came across so many examples. I mean, they were a real married couple, these two. Oh, absolutely. As devoted absolutely. as they were to each other, they would have real married couple arguments. Um, yeah. And I, I must say, though, you know, I think as rough of a go as she had of it as first lady, uh, as controversial as she was, the country really gets a different view of her, a different understanding of her, a different appreciation of her after the presidency. When he, he is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it falls upon her to not only become the caretaker of him physically and of his dignity, but mm -hmm. also to become the caretaker of his legacy. Right. And I was so struck by how shrewd she was about that as well. Um, she doesn't want him to, she never does, seems to have trust, trusted ideologues. She's very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of, I, one of the things I thought she did that was the smartest was that, you're right, people wanted to sort of write him off. Oh, he's just a Hollywood actor reading his lines. And she decides to do something extraordinary, which is to publish his handwritten diaries and publish a half century of his correspondence and publish the handwritten speeches he had been given before he ran for president so that Americans could see in his own handwriting, in his own words, that these, these were the ideas of Ronald Reagan, that he really did come to office with a fully formed idea of where he wanted to take the country and how he wanted to govern it. And I always thought, you know, that was in some ways that last decade of her life was really her final gift to him and really the the greatest testament of her love for him because people would no longer cynically think that this, this adoring gaze that she had, had cast on him throughout their marriage and their public life was anything but genuine. Well, I can attest, I can attest to the fact that it was genuine. I, one of my favorite memories of him was when, um, I was at the Reagan Library and I was upstairs. Oh, just, just lift your screen just a bit. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, um, he he said, "Hey, Sheila, come here." And he took me he took me over to the facing west, and he he leaned down. He says, "Look down. See that down there?" He says, "That's that's where they're going to plant me." <laughs> he could he. Was, how could you not love somebody like him? I mean, he had, he was such a genuine person, whatever he was, whatever he felt, he said, and he just, you, you felt better. I'll never forget one time going up to pick her up in the, in the residence to go somewhere. And she was running late and he came out to apparently, you know, keep me company. And, um, he, the things he said about Nancy Reagan and, and how, much he loved her just I they always stuck in my head because he just he couldn't stop talking about it and about how wonderful his life was and he had just and then the other thing is he said and you know what today I had a call from a woman a German woman who's gotten to the United States and she had hidden a Jewish girl during the war and he said she told me the story she's probably except for Nancy the most wonderful amazing person I have ever talked to and I mean he he just wanted he had to talk about it it was really interesting he, wow. he was he was quite a guy well again I think we are, are coming to the end of our half hour but again Sheila I have am so grateful to you and your many insights and uh you know, I, I loved I loved your book and it was just so valuable to me as I was trying to write mine. So well I loved your book. I read it. I sat down 
early one morning and I never got up until that, until it was time for dinner. I read the whole book and I just could, I mean, you could have written twice that much and I'd still be sitting there. It was just really, really amazing. I loved the book. Well, thank you. So thank we're, you. we're the mutual admiration system. Well, again, thank you very much. And uh, I think we'd like to thank everybody who joined us this evening as well. And take a look at both of our books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.